This webinar uh, is uh, going to be moderated by Alex Truesdale and our panelists are Elise Anderson from, from Charleston and Vijay Shah from New York. Presenters will be Barbara Bassi from Henry Ford Hospital and Amit Kaki also from St. John's in, 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 in Detroit. Um, the, the, what we need to do is to acknowledge uh, Medtronics who have been a, a great sponsor of this program. You can claim CME for this program as well through Skype. And these are the disclosures. I'll monitor the chat questions and uh, bring up the appropriate ones as we go along. So without much ado, I'll hand it over to Alex to start uh, the show. Thank you, everybody. Great, thanks uh, very much, Tanvir. Thanks to everyone who's uh, joining us. Thanks to the uh, presenters and the uh, panelists. And uh, so it's great, as if uh, cardiogenic shock wasn't hard enough and bifurcation lesions weren't hard enough, we thought we'd combine, uh, combine them together for what'll be some really exciting cases. So I think, um, Baba, you're gonna uh, start off and uh, let's jump right in. Awesome. Well, thanks everybody for um, having me. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, these are my uh, personal disclosures. So this was a 80 year old patient, um, had a remote history of a TIA a few months prior to his arrival. He came in at three in the morning he had some right-sided neck pain, woke him up from sleep. He had similar pain off and on for the past two days, but it was more short-lived. His the symptoms became more consistent uh, when he woke up. He came in mildly um, a hypotensive, a 96 over 67. However, his heart rate was 74. His x-ray did not reveal anything um, significant. Um, the emergency department did get the ECG that you see on the right-hand side, um, shows maybe a little bit of elevation and leads 2-3 and AVF um, with uh, ST depressions in V1 through V3. Um, they didn't activate the cath lab right away. Um, they had one of our cardiology fellows review, and in the meantime, they had um, gotten a CTA of the head and neck which revealed no dissection and no PE. Patient had a creatinine of 1.28. His GFR was 57. First troponin came back at 77. First lactate uh, was um, 2.2 and his hemoglobin was normal. And so uh, the patient had ongoing symptoms. The cardiology fellow notified me. This is all within the matter of about 20 minutes or so. And the cath lab was activated thereafter. So we brought the patient um, to the cath lab, and uh, as you can see, he has um, some left main um, disease. Um, looks like there's some disease in the osteal and distal aspects of the left main. His um, right coronary artery is occluded. Um, uh, he has uh, his probably culprit lesion within the uh, mid circumflex as well. You can see that it's maybe Timmy two and a half flow. And then you also notice that he has a pretty heavily calcified um, prox to mid LAD lesion as well. So this is the scenario and the story that we have here. Um, what would you do for this patient? What's your next best step? Um, options include immediate PCI. Should we do a right heart cath because he was hypotensive and get a little bit more information? Um, do we need to think about MCS? And if so, a use of a balloon pump or impella? Or should we pick um, another strategy? Any thoughts from our, our panelists about what they think is the next best step? My only question would be, was he on any pressors when he came up to the lab at this point? Because he was hypotensive in the ER. Yeah, so he had gotten uh, a little fluid bolus. It didn't actually change his pressure, but he did not require any vasopressors yet. Gotcha. And looking at the RCA, were there any bridging collaterals to convince you that was chronic versus... Um, there were no bridging collaterals, but um, it definitely had the appearance of a, of a chronic thrombus. Uh, excuse me, a chronic occlusion without thrombus. So, Barbara, one of the things that comes up in the ER frequently is them doing all these CTP and dissection protocols. So, the uh, and you know, the creatinine is 1.2, the patient's elderly. And I've tried to convince our ER for the most part that 
He really thinks ACS and try to avoid the extra contrast load for these patients. So do you think that that was appropriate first step for them uh, when you had the scheme of an EKG and you know borderline, well, an elevated history component to start with about, you know, yeah, no, we, we've had a very, very similar discussion. In fact, we even talk about, you know, one of the mantras, I think, in the emergency department is if you think of it, you should rule it out. And so then I always say you can think of dissection, for example, but I can rule it out for you after I do the coronary angiogram. Because, you know, yes, you can have a concomitant RCA dissection and um AM ascending aortic dissection. You don't have to give them their dual antiplatelet therapy in that scenario, but just a phone call to me, and then I can always do an aortogram. Um, but you know, even we can you know diagnose PE and all of these other things as needed. But I think with that ECG, I completely agree. I think the cath lab should have been activated immediately, and and no other testing needed to be done. Yeah, I'll, I'll add even if it's not you know, cath lab activation, but interventional cardiologists consulted. The, the other thing, which I think will be really interesting to see evolving over time is increased use of point of care ultrasound, you know, bedside echo. Uh, you know, I'd be curious to see um, new uh, ER graduates in a lot of specialties where that's just really part of the skill set. And so I was, when I was looking at this question, I was actually going to ask everyone not just what's the next best step, but what are your thought process? Like, what are you doing? So like, I'm thinking, okay, I'm, I'm, they're getting the patient on the table. I'm thinking, okay, you know, hypotensive, tachycardic, elevated lactate, hyperperfusion, you know, hopefully I'm, you know, we keep an echo machine in every cath lab. So I'm, you know, just doing a quick bedside echo at the same time. And then I'm thinking my personal first step is to get an uh, end diastolic pressure. So then I have all that data really at the very beginning you know, leading into coronary uh, angiography too. So I've just sort of, you know, round the, uh, round the table, so to speak about, you know, not just where it's the next best step, but how are you integrating that in information? Yeah, I think in this case, you know, if, if you're fairly convinced that the RCA is not acute, I just couldn't see it very clearly. And you said there were, um, but that you, it had the appearance of a CTO, you know, the CERC isn't, fully occluded. It's got to me to flow. It's, you know, critical and it's probably the culprit. Um, but what I mean to say is that when it's a, when it's a, an acute occlusion, like an LED, a large RCA, the idea would be that perhaps if you, you know, immediately revascularize the pressures will start, the human dynamics will change pretty quickly. But in this case, there is some forward flow. So I just don't expect crossing the circ, ballooning it open to suddenly create such a huge change in hemodynamics right away. Um, which is why in this case, I'd probably opt for, you know, a right heart cath thinking I'm probably going to need an MCS just given again, that I don't, I don't see things, things look a bit more chronic. That's gotten worse with probably some plaque rupture on top of it in the, in the circ. Um, with the chronic disease in the LAD, chronic disease in the RCA, and things just not necessarily turning around very quickly. So that's, I think I would lean towards towards that. Yeah, I think that's actually extremely reasonable. I, I totally agree. I think that the comments that you made, particularly about the, the chronicity of yeah. the LAD and the right coronary make a lot of sense, right? I mean, at the end of the day, it's not just a quick in and out in terms of, of getting a fix. And so then, you know, we are talking about the bifurcation and this was the lesion um, within the circumflex. And so I guess, um, you know, what I did is, is I, I placed a guide. And as soon as I placed the guide, um, the patient went into a junctional escape rhythm and became bradycardic. So now um, outside of chasing to do a TVP, does it change your plan at all? It's going to change my plan, but uh, especially you already have a hypertension. You already know that the patient's hyperperfusing based on the lactic acid and everything else that you've shown. And I would rather be a little bit more proactive versus crashing something on later, get more information. For me, I would have done exactly what Benita said. I probably would have done a right heart cath real quick just to get some hemodynamics to know what I need to do. Maybe get the interventional fellow to prep a micropuncture for um, support, see what I need to do. But um it definitely going into a bradycardic rhythm, your cardiac output's going to go further down and you're going to start to spiral. And that pulse pressure worries me, right? It's not just your systolic blood pressure, that, that pulse pressure itself, even though the systolic is in the 90s, the pulse pressure is very worrisome. 
Yeah, that's a great point. I'd say I would even go a step further. I think that's way more, you know, important, right? Because that's demonstrating it's your surrogate, you know, ejection fraction that there's not a lot of change in systole and uh, and diastole. So I think it's a, you know, this is a good point. I think particularly for the you know fellows, all of these little things. It's not just the angiogram, but these little clues even before you take the angiogram that are already starting to you know pique your interest and and have you thinking about what your strategy might be even without yet knowing the coronary anatomy. Yeah, so one thing I didn't mention is I did put a, um, a diagnostic into the LV when I uh, did the original pictures and the LV EDP was 24. Um, so we have that added piece of information. And so I started firstly with a, a TVP um, and then from my standpoint, the patient's not on any pressors yet. Um, I have a very high um, suspicion, just as you all do as well, uh, that I would need support. And if, you know, um, if I would get myself into trouble, then, uh, you know, that would be my approach. Um, and, you know, I don't, I think there's a, there's a huge difference between um, preemptive um, MCS and bailout MCS. Um, but at the same time, there is a spectrum there, right? And clearly, I'm not talking about using it in just a bailout scenario here. But I felt that because he's not on any pressors, I have a little bit of wiggle room to bring up pressures if I need to, um, that I could actually, you know, tackle this lesion um, with PCI first. And so um, we were um, a radial approach. And maybe we can just take a second just in terms of PCI and discussing if you were going for PCI here and you had this angiogram and you have this lesion and then after the lesion, you know, it's not necessarily crystal clear how much disease you have and you have these three almost equal sized branches. Um, what do you do? Do you, do you wire everything at three in the morning? Do you wire the left main and um, into the uh, LAD and then the circ and and just choose one branch. Do you choose two branches? Um, always tough decisions, I think, and and things that fellows always ask. What makes you decide what to wire? Yeah. So before we go on, then in the chat, there's a question on: um, Would you put in MCS and and call CP surgery? Uh, I I personally I think the EKG showed elevations in the inferior leads and depressions with big R waves and the and the anterior leads suggesting posterior ST elevations. If they were posterior leads, I, I'm sure they would have seen elevations and with ongoing chest pain um, would have um, continued down the PCI, P PCI route. Um, but if anyone else has any questions there to the... No, the treatment is an acute infarct to do private PCI. It's not, not MCS and cabbage. And this anatomy is really horrible. I mean, so. Um, would one of you want to tackle the bifurcation question and uh, yeah. what the wire not, and then we we would take we would move along? So I'm certainly putting my main wire in that middle branch just because it seems like a straighter shot, <laughs> um, and uh, and potentially putting a second wire down in the in the lateral branch, um, the one that is. Um, not going off towards the, yeah, yeah, that one. Only because it looked like in the moving videos that that vessel had less flow. Um, if I remember correctly, it had, you know, it, that that was a vessel that sort of struck out to me with, with a bit more to me too flow. And then yeah. we'll give some nitro and see if things look any better for a distal landing zone. I like it. I, I didn't give the nitro in this case just because of the hypotension, but I did the same thing. I took the, 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 the middle branch, thought it was the biggest, um, uh, did a quick balloon because I didn't think my IVUS would get past it and then um, brought my IVUS catheter down. And, uh, you know, in the back of my mind, um, you know, I had the you know, the idea that this patient's creatinine's one four. He's he got actually a hundred and sixty cc's of dye already, a hundred for the CTPE. And I don't know why they ran it as two different studies, but his his um head and neck um CT had, had an additional bolus. So I was really worried about contrast. 
And here's some still images of, of the IVIS. My um, IVIS imaging, if I play the whole video, becomes very challenging and a uh, huge file. But the, the, the top panel here represents what was the um, baseline um, uh, in terms of the distal reference. And then as we move forward here, actually, the second panel, I think, is really nice. So remember, imaging can help you just in terms of your bifurcation as well, right? And so just as what, um, you know, Dr. Shaw mentioned earlier, you can actually see that that lateral branch actually had disease in it. And so, um, you know, it's pretty clear in terms of the IVIS. Here's the large kind of positively remodeled um, thrombotic area. You can see maybe even a necrotic core. This is clearly, um, you know, not a high definition um, intravascular imaging. And then there was a lot of diffuse disease within the ostium. There was actually probably, you know, at least 50% disease by IVIS, but this was an area that I identified on the bottom right that was my kind of most healthy segment. And so, um, I went on to balloon um, and I ballooned both the after the main branch. I also ballooned the side branch because of um, that disease. And now I have a little bit of no reflow. So um, at this point, uh, I went back, I re-imaged, make sure I didn't have any dissection. Um, I did not give any um, intracoronary epinephrine. Uh, in, in my mind, I wanted to basically um, think about what was next. So blood pressure dropped a little bit, 90 over 60. So I started norepinephrine, five mics, um, and then I went into, you know, with my stent. So this was a 3038 um, drug eluding stent. I stented into the, the middle blood vessel, landed according to what I thought was, um, you know, guided by my imaging, both my distal and proximal reference. And um, so now I'm in this spot here and I take this angiogram after my stents in. And now this is, this is where I am. Clearly better flow in the middle branch, but um, not so much in the upper branch. And I'm curious now, does this change your plan at all? I was actually going to ask you one question even before that, Bobber, because this, this comes up a lot. So um, about selection of a wire that you use when you're jailing a wire. Because I think a, a lot of fellows ask that question. In terms of uh, what wires I like to jail or don't jail? Exactly. I, I find that comes up a, a, a lot. People ask or worried about trapping, you know, trapping wires, which wires not to use. So what, what did you do here? So, so this is a Xi'an Blue and Manamo. Um, um, I use Xi'an Blue Manamo and um, run through as kind of my three workhorse wires. Um, you know, the run through has a marker on the back of it. Um, the Xi'an Blue is black and then the Manamo is green. And so it allows me to always identify the three wires that I have. And in this case, I use the, the two different colors, especially at three in the morning. So, um, you know, I, I have uh, zero qualms about um, uh, trapping, jailing wires. Uh, personally, um, you know, there's a nice study in the that was done that a uh, polymer jacketed wires um, when they are um, um, jailed and, and then they're pulled back that you can do electron microscopy to <laughs> cadaver hearts and notice that there is polymer within the um, heart that's actually deposited, you know, that's kind of left over. Um, so clearly, you know, polymer jacketed wires um, you know, may you may not want to do that if you are worried about it, but is there any clinical consequence of, of doing that? I don't know. Uh, in this case, with thrombus and, uh, you know, no reflow, I was very happy that I, I jailed the wire. Um, you know, sometimes you can't get these vessels back, and then clearly you haven't done the patient any good. So I'll be honest. So at this point, I'm like, oh man, now I got to recross. I have a lot of no reflow. I'm on five mics of norepinephrine. He's not doing very good. His blood pressure is still disease or is still low. I have some, you know, left main disease. I had the um, RCA that was CTO. So 
you know, he, he's not crashing and burning by any means, but I felt I wanted a little bit of extra help. And so I actually um, got um, femoral access and um, put in um, a support device. Now, I didn't choose an impella in this situation, which I know everyone in the world is going to think that I was doing, but um, actually the, the most consistently used device in, in the United States is still an intraortic balloon pump. And I felt very comfortable that this patient's in stage B shock. Um, his lactate was only 2-2. He's conversing with me. Um, and so I ended up putting in, in a balloon pump. And so I recrossed. I did a, a quick kiss uh, onto that um, um, bifurcation. Uh, I uh, did a proximal optimization with a 3.5 balloon. And um, this was the ultimate result that I got. Uh, much better. Um, and then I, you know, again, it's... Um, three in the morning going on to five in the morning. You can probably see the left main disease a little bit more here. Um, and I did want to get a better idea of, you know, he's, you know, kind of borderline. It, is there something that I'm missing on the angio? And so I did put the wire into the um, LAD and just do a short IVUS run. And you can see that there is disease, there's calcification, there's severe calcification in the very stenotic mid LAD segment, but nothing in the left main that I felt I couldn't at least, you know, stop in terms of my procedure today. So um, that's kind of where I left it at this point. Um, this was the final picture was, after some vasodilators. You can see the um, the, the final the final angiograms here. Yeah, and this is a, a small point, but um, especially for if there are any fellows um, who are on the webinar. But you know, with the flow that was going on in that side branch, um, took a third wire, or do you just pull this wire back? I personally would have taken a third wire at that point just to just to keep one wire in place. Um, so I would have potted first and then taken a, a third wire down before pulling out the jailed wire. Um, yep, I did. I swapped wires. I didn't pot first, but I swapped wires um, into the side branch first I, I, with a new third wire. I don't also um, flip flop wires. Most of the time, I, I'll just get a new wire myself as well. And then I did um, uh, regained access to the side branch kissed and then did a final pot. Yeah, it saves on contrast too, right? You already know where to go. <laughs> you don't have to keep puffing for it. Um, and then if you don't pot first, sometimes you can, um, if you just to just to keep things moving rather quickly, you can even consider a dual lumen catheter, um, so that you aren't struggling too much um, getting into you know recrossing that whole area. I think, so I think those are super key points because, right? I mean, the the the, the notion, the pot leaving your wire, going in with another wire. You know, we've all seen these be 15 minute solutions or, you know, one hour solutions. And some of it's just sticking to those algorithms and mentally rehearsing them, you know, ahead of time. And I know there's a lot of great um, bifurcation um, apps and resources, and it's probably worth, you know, everyone kind of having those at your fingertips and reviewing them in time of not need so that you have it available in your brain at, at time of need. And this was a, a great example. And I particularly like the the pot point, I, I, I try and always remember that too, because it really makes your life a lot easier if you can. So I removed the TVP um, after revascularization, he um, went back to his sinus rhythm um, and I used that access to place a swan. So these are his hemodynamics. His right atrial pressure was 15. His wedge uh, increased a little bit. His EDP, as I told you, was 24. His wedge is now 28. Index was 1.93. Um, CPO 0 0.67 and pulmonary artery pulsatility index 2.5. Um, he's able to be off of the norepinephrine, the five mics that he was on, and he's on a balloon pump alone. So anything else to do? Would anybody want to treat the left main LAD now? Do you upgrade MCS based on these hemodynamics? I mean, you've got plenty of room um, if you need to add another or even go back on, you know, a little even epi if you wanted to choose something else to help with your um, your um, index and your output. You're right there. You're almost at 0.7 for your CPO. So I probably would have not 
escalated MCS at this point. I'm definitely not going to go after the left main LED right now. You've got good flow. You're hemodynamically improving and probably let some of these things cool off, get better, you know, just better perfusion and bring them back. Yeah. And I think that's what culprit shock really taught us, right? I mean, if you can wait, it's probably reasonable to wait. And then there are certain situations where you can't wait. And I think if um, you can't wait in a situation like this, where I did have to do the left main LAD or um, anything like that, then I would have probably, you know, um, earlier on have thought to have escalated my support and probably have chosen a more robust um, support device at that time. But I felt pretty comfortable here um, not doing that. And I, I did just that. I, I stopped. Uh, I gave him a little bit of a break. And actually, he didn't even go to the ICU. <laughs> there was a bed shortage. He stayed in the cubicles for 12 hours. Um, and so then at 6 p.m. when the nurses wanted to go home, he, the balloon pump came out. He did great. And he actually went to the floor. So um, I waited a couple of days. So three days later, now we have a little bit more information. So his point of care ultrasound in the ED showed an EF of around 40%, but actually uh, with Definity and, and some time, his EF was 27%. As I mentioned, his RCA was a CTO. Um, I, from the LAD, when I, when we did the IVIS, you know, I didn't show that the, the mid LAD, but it was, you know, severely um, calcified. So it, I knew I was going to need atherectomy. He's a recent STEMI. Uh, he recently was in stage B shock. So what's your strategy for that part of the PCI. Any kind of quick responses and I'll, I'll get right to it. Here's his access if you want to know what it looks like. <laughs> and his hemodynamics now are, are improved or they're still about the same? So his right heart cath was taken out um, after the procedure. Um, I don't have hemodynamics, but his blood pressure is normal. Meaning it's gone up to like 120. Yes, yes. Yeah. 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 So I think it just sort of depends on if you know this patient or not, right? Meaning, um, depending on which hospital you're working on, you know, you're sometimes in the city hospital. I don't really know what this patient is going to do if they're going to take their adapt, if they're not, you know, and then sometimes I, I stage it out a little bit. But if you feel like you know this patient, um, patient's going to be able to follow up, is going to be able to take their medications, I then err on the side of, um, uh, fixing, you know, before discharge. Um, but I do. Yeah, and it may not have come off very well on, on the images and it, it, you, it may even just kind of gotten lost and, and forgotten, but his mid LED was very tight. I mean, it was, you know, 90%, um, uh, very, very tight lesion. And I, I completely agree. If I think if you can let him out of the hospital, it's reasonable to, but in this case, I, di I didn't think that was an option. So, and, 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 you know, whether yeah, you use support, if I knew that he's a good candidate for whatever meds and everything, then I would do it in house for sure. Yeah. So in this case, you know, I, I didn't know. Should we use support for the st stage PCI? Should we not? I mean, I got through everything with the balloon pump. Um, maybe I could get through it again, except I'm going to do a lot more atherectomy this time. Um, you know, what, what is the right uh, answer? So actually, um, this was version one of Protect4. So balloon pump was not excluded. Don't anybody get me in trouble right now. Um, but it was, uh, I, I did it by protocol. And so it was an unprotected left main, EF less than 30% after a STEMI, need for atherectomy. And so we actually enrolled him into the Protect4 trial. And so I'll, I'll be a little bit quicker here. So his right atrial pressure, we're in the the right heart cath substudy was four. His wedge was eight. His index actually came up to 2.2. And then we had to actually do a lot of atherectomy within the um, LAD. It took six runs, 30 seconds, um, uh, you know, uh, and he got a very reasonable result from that. So um, what you see on the top panel is a 3038, a drug eluding stent. Then we IVIS into the circ. Ivis back into the LAD. Our strategy was to use a DK crush here. So we used uh, four millimeter balloons within uh, both of the, the vessels. Um, this is the stent followed by um, the crush in the top right hand side. Um, again, I didn't use a lot of dye, so I don't have pictures. This is all kind of Ivis guided. Um, this is the first kiss on the on the bottom. And then the, the this um, panel here where my arrow is, is the left main to LAD stent, followed by a pot 
recross and then the second kiss so these are the the equipment that we used um ultimately potted uh with a 50 and the sks was done with a 35 and 45 um balloon and so um I think got a pretty reasonable result. Here's the collaterals that you can see to the RCA as well. Um, in this case, the patient was 80 years old, um, had no symptoms on follow-up. Yeah, I'm a believer of complete revascularization. I think it's a very pretty straightforward CTO to cross as well, but um, we elected not to do that. So he had an um, um, early bird for a couple of days because he was in that trial. It was removed after two day, two hours, excuse me. He was discharged the following day. He clearly gets follow-up for all of his research studies. So his EF improved to uh, 46%, no hospitalizations, no angina. So he's been doing really good. So um, that was the case. Beautiful result. Great case, excellent, excellent. Yeah, that, that was a great case, uh, uh, Bob. I'm, I'm kind of disappointed you didn't show four different bifurcation lesions. You only did two, <laughs> but uh, no, I think I, what it what really highlights for me is the results. So, and I, you know, sometimes I think that gets lost in the presentation is you're making, a, there's a lot of rapid binary decision-making minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day. And I think that's really, um, really important and really key. And then some of those technical finer points, which also get, you know, lost about wire protection, the pot, you know, the kiss using intracoronary imaging. And not only does it get you a great durable result, so we don't pass or pat ourselves on the back and say the patient got out of the lab safely, which is a pretty low bar, but hey, this patient didn't come back to the lab. They didn't get rehospitalized. They're doing great in the community. And that's really the bar we should be setting. So I, I think this really hit all those um, um, uh, points, which is now setting a super high bar for our second presenter, uh, uh, Amir Khaki. We'll see if we can uh, uh, measure up. Uh, well, if we want to move on to move on to your case, Amir. Yes. Now let me share my screen here, and then we'll get started. Uh, Alex, can you see my screen, sir? I can't. Well, it's, yeah. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Okay. So I uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Rab and Alex, uh, for having me. Um, obviously, we know the theme, and I was asked to speak about a patient who had a bifurcation and acute cardiogenic shock, as well as hostile PAD. These are my disclosures as it relates to this particular presentation. Um, so this is an 84-year-old female. Uh, she's an artist by profession. Um, she had an exhibition planned on the weekend that she presented to the emergency room. She came in at middle of the night on a Friday, I think around 3 a.m., and complaining of epigastric discomfort radiating to her substernal area. And she was supposed to exhibit her art, I think, that Saturday afternoon. She has a past medical history, just really notable for hypertension and remotely used to smoke. Uh, at presentation, she was hemodynamically stable. I'll share with you her EKG, which was concerning. Uh, her metabolic profile, CBC, were normal, and her biomarker troponin was elevated at 5.6. Uh, here's her EKG, and you can take a look at it for a minute. Uh, there's some ST depression in the, in the lateral leads. There was some questionable ST elevation in V1 and V2. And you can see she had some reciprocal depressions in the inferior leads. Uh, because of that tracing and her presentation, she was taken to the catheterization lab at about 3 a.m. And you can see she has a large dominant right coronary artery. Uh, she has a co-dominant circ, and she has a critical disease at the left main, proximal circumflex in the LAD. And you can see the TIMI flow in the LAD is, I uh, would describe it as TIMI 2. And you can see her left ventricular uh, function there on the V-gram. So I guess I would just ask you guys, in a case like this, uh, can anyone uh, qualify uh, the lesion characteristics just based on the angiogram? Is that, throm is that thrombus or is that calcium? Uh, given her presentation, can you make that distinction or do you not, not know until you do imaging? What do you think, Dr. Rab? I think it's, um, you know, the, the way it's circumscribed uh, it's probably calcium, okay? Thrombus has a bit of irregularity to it. And certainly a distal left main, thrombus looks very different from, from this. It's in a, a big film defects. 
if it is a thrombotic lesion. But it's probably calcified distal left main and calcified nodule proximality. Okay. I think that's a very, uh, very astute point. I, uh, I agree. I was concerned if you, I don't know, do you guys agree that the flow in the LAD is Timmy 2? Yes. Okay. Timmy 1 and a half. <laughs> okay. Um, the operator uh, did an angiogram um, and uh, femoral angiogram. What was EDP, Amir, I mean, in this case? EDP was 30 at that time. And they did this angiogram anticipating to put the patient on mechanical circulatory support. The operator um, was a mature operator, probably practicing for about eight to 10 years. And after this iliofemoral angiogram, um, patient felt that the patient's um, was prohibitive based on the tortuosity for uh, large bore mechanical circulatory support. So we could have that conversation. This is the uh, echocardiogram, which was done uh, Saturday morning. This was about four hours later. And you can see that uh, with the contrast, you can see it more that there is some hypokinesis of the anterior wall and the septal. And it was quantified at uh, 35%. So with that, uh, you know, what were the treatment considerations? So she was 84. It happened at 3 a.m. Uh, at this point, uh, what would you guys do? And I'll tell you what the operator did. Do you want, what would you do, Alex Truesdale, at an, uh, if this patient was in your institution? Yeah, you know, uh, so first of all, 84, I think not just my institution, I think most institutions, the person's not going to go for bypass surgery. So that's, that's already, you know, in, in my mind, no matter how, as I say, I, I know everyone's a healthy 84 car with 400,000 miles works until you pop the hood and you see squirrels in there. And uh, so it's that, you know, this is not someone who's going to go to surgery. I, you know, I think the decision um, about whether you act immediately or whether you stop, get some additional data and act in a, a, a rapid fashion is reasonable. What I sometimes worry about and I see is somebody says, well, we're going to decide. And then this person goes to the ICU. And I think if you're going to wait more than an hour, two hours, or you're going to make, or at least take longer to make a decision, you've already made a decision. So if you're going to push this to the next day, and just wait until the patient's in multi-organ failure, you have made a passive decision instead of an active decision to do nothing. And mm -hmm. so, you know, if this patient's crashing, I'm going, you know, right in um, with uh, a percutaneous coronary intervention, probably with a support of some sort. If there's some other complexities and they're stable enough, I think I can stop, pull in colleagues, but really feel like a decision has to be made within you know, an hour, two hours, three hours at most. Otherwise, um, I, I don't think you're going to have a decision to be made personally. Okay. Yeah, I mean, there's so, still, oh, not just in the LAD, but also the circumflex. This entire, you know, LCA circulation is, has got slow flow, not to me three flow. Yes. So I agree with those comments. And this is what, um, this is exactly what happened as the, 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 the strategies that were considered that night. Medical therapy uh, was considered coronary artery bypass surgery, which was we discussed. I'll tell you what the surgeons decided at our institution. High risk PCI uh, with a balloon pump given the iliofemoral tortuosity. Um, high risk PCI with impella on standby. That's something that you know I personally don't think is a good idea, but is that does uh, occur. And high risk PCI with upfront um, mechanical support with an impella using alternative access. So, medical therapy we decided uh, was not reasonable, or the team did, because she was highly functional, and uh, we felt that she still had a uh, life expectancy that was uh, that was reasonable. Uh, surgery uh, was consulted in the middle of the night. They did come to their credit uh, early Saturday morning, and as Alex alluded to, they felt that. Uh, her surgical risk was prohibitive, so she was uh, turned down. Uh, High-risk PCI with a balloon pump. You just saw that Bobber effectively uh, did a case with that. It's not uh, not an unreasonable approach. We talked about high-risk PCI with Impella on standby. I'd like to hear the panel's opinion on this. I personally think that's a bad idea. If you look at the uh, CVAD registry, obviously that's confounded by the patient's, uh, you know, selection bias. But in patients who are undergoing high-risk PCI, who got impella, 
um, as crash and burn impella in that setting, not up front. They had a high mortality as high as 50%. Obviously, a lot of confounders in those, that population. And then high-risk PCI with up, up front impella using an alternative access. That's what was all considered. So what would you guys do uh, given the consideration? So Benita, what would you guys do in New York out of those options that we offered? Yeah, um, I mean, we would have started off with a right heart cath just to get a sense of of the of the numbers. Um, I think balloon pump is reasonable, but I also don't think that that tortuosity is prohibitive towards an impella up front through a transfemoral access approach. So okay. um, I would be I would be thinking uh, either a balloon pump first or just an impella up front through a transfemoral approach. Um, I think once you get into alternative access and an eighty four year old, you're I mean, if, as long as you do everything meticulously, it's, it's great. I just, um, I feel like we do tavers in this type of tortuosity, so we should be able to turn them. Yeah, that's very reasonable. So I'll tell you what happened in the case. Uh, surgeons were consulted. The patient was deemed prohibitive risk due to advanced age and limited ability to rehabilitate. We planned to, to do a high-risk PCI with Impella. Uh, we were going to stage it. Uh, we wanted to use her axillary. We felt the, uh, I think uh, Benita brings up a good point. Could we have gotten away with us, uh, you know, stiff wires and straightening the iliofemorals out? I think you could have. Um, our institution, we have a couple operators that feel very comfortable with axillary. And so they've been able to do that successfully. And the threshold is, is probably lower than most. Um, and then we would do, uh, you know, obviously, I, Ibis guided DK crush to that uh, left main and uh, modify based on the plaque morphology. Uh, use a right heart cath to wean, and that was what our plan was. What happened to this patient is despite our planning, the patient became hypotensive despite uh, her balloon pump, um, and we decided to go to the cath lab sooner than uh, planned. So the balloon pump uh, did not ameliorate her symptoms long enough. Uh, the right heart cath showed she had an index of 1.4, CPO 0.6, a mixed venous of 39. So based on that, um, those hemodynamics that were deteriorating, we thought it was best to do her urgently. So the decision was to go up front with an alternative access, and this is an axillary impella. I won't go into the details on the axillary because not the purpose of the presentation, but you can see here we have from the um, femoral artery where we're going to do the PCI. We leverage that and we have a catheter there. That catheter gives us angiographic guidance of the second segment of the axillary artery. Uh, Raj Tayal and um, James McCabe are uh, really kind of pioneered this technique and uh, they do it a little differently than we do in Detroit. They like to use ultrasound. And if you're fast on with ultrasound, that's a good way to do it. We use angiographic guidance and you could definitely hit the second part of the second of the axillary artery without a lot of difficulty. The only meaningful things that you should know about this angiogram is this vessel that goes north here uh, supplies the, the humeral head. And in the event that we don't get successful hemostasis and you have to use a covered stent, you can potentially cause avascular necrosis of the humeral head. So for that reason, we like to be away from it more proximal. The other thing that's important on the access point is you don't want to invade the chest and you can see we're far away in this particular case, the patient had a long reg long runway of the second segment of the axillary artery. Also here, the third segment where you see the branch, the circumflex humeral um, going up, uh, you, this is where you can see the, you can't see that, but this is where the brachial cords are of the brachial plexus. They're superficial at this segment of the axillary artery. And as you get proximal, they actually dive down deep. So superficially here, when you make uh, get access in the vessel, it's devoid of the of the cord. So also that's another reason you want to stick there. So we were able to successfully get access here in the second segment where we wanted to, and we put a sheath in there and then ended up getting the impella in with really without much difficulty. So we went on to the PCI and the PCI we did, I have the, um, the IVIS, I should put the IVIS first, but circumferential calcium, as Dr. Uh, Rab uh, alluded to, of the uh, both lesions in the LAD, distal left main, and the circumflex. I'll show you those IVIS. And as a result of that, we decided to do orbital atherectomy, particularly to the LAD. We did not, um, this was done maybe two and a half years ago. We did not have shockwave at the time. So we modified the circumflex with non compliant balloon. 
if you look at the angle of that circumflex, at least in, in my humble opinion and experience, I felt that angle was pro prohibitive for overall atherectomy. I know we have a lot of people here on the panel that use rotablator uh, much more than I do. I use mostly orbital. I'd like to get their opinion. Uh, do you guys ever take angle or tortuosity into consideration when you're choosing ro rotational versus orbital versus a neither? In my opinion, I tend to avoid um, atherectomy and acute angles and in tortuous vessels because uh, perforations often end up to be catastrophic and difficult to deal with in those situations. Now that we have shockwave, it really makes that decision much easier. Do you guys, uh, I know uh, Bobber and Alex, uh, you guys use rotablator more than I do. Would you guys uh, rotablate this circ or is that angle prohibitive? Would you use shockwave these days or orbital? Uh, what's, your, what's your atherectomy or debulking uh, strategy in these cases? I think both are appropriate. I, I think, you know, uh, I wouldn't have uh, much hesitation with this angle um, doing rota. I think when you get multiple, um, you know, um, uh, angles together, and there's a lot of tortuosity, it can be um, higher risk. What's interesting is, is that there's risks on both ends. With rota, the risk is getting stuck, which is really scary. But with um, orbital, there's actually a risk of, you um, dislodgement of the the burr itself um and so that's something that we've actually reported on where where it actually broke due to the tortuosity um it, despite being only used on low speed so those are my thoughts okay yeah i also worry about the circumflex in particular i feel like that angle is always more acute than it sometimes looks angiographically and you only start recognizing that as you're trying to deliver more bulky equipment. So I, I do get a little bit more worried with, with atherectomy on those, um, on the circumflex. Okay. Yeah, one of the things is, you know, um, remember the issue of wire bias, you know, you may be cutting into adventitia and not really black at an acute angle, but I think this angle is not that terrible to, to allow 1.5 bird to advance really slowly into that segment. And you may be at a lower speed of 160 rather than 180 or 200 and see how it, how it reacts to you. But I think this is dual. The other thing is we have not commented about the nodularity of the lesion. You know, calcified nodules are big in our interventional world right now. So what is the best strategy? Is it, is it rotational? Is it uh, orbital? Is it shockwave? Or a mixture of both? So I think that's something we need to address between calcified eccentric left main nodules and nodules in the LED because they, there is a you know, malignant kind of eruptive nodule that may go through the stent struts. So what is the best strategy to shave it off is also something that we need to think about. I'm also not willing to give up my LED wire if I needed to do something that required me to move wires around. Yeah. Be in the circumflex. I think those are, uh, those are all excellent points. So we did atherectomy to the circumflex and then we use a non-compliant balloon to the, uh, excuse me, atherectomy to the LED and a non-compliant balloon to the circumflex. And I don't know if these are going to run here. It looks like these are still, but they're not going to run. But you could see here, this patient had more circumferential calcium. This arc was about 180 degrees. Um, and uh, after we did the debulking, um, we decided to use a, a DK crush strategy for this left main. And here you could see these are all still images, but we went through the steps of DK crush on support. Um, and I think this is where I think mechanical support really helps and bifurcation, particularly in ACS patients. Um, if you're gonna do a DK crush on these patients, it does take a little bit more time. It does take some more patience and steps. You are occlusive to the whole. Uh, left uh, coronary system dependent on a right coronary system. But in a setting of a patient who presents with ACS, uh, patients often are not tolerant. And unfortunately, I didn't bring the hemodynamics from the impella console, but uh, all of you have seen how these patients respond. Uh, they lose pulsatility to become hemodynamically dependent on the device. And this oftentimes, particularly if they have really bad LV function, you could have uncoupling, um, which Bobber has really described uh, and the early use of impella in these types of patients. So we did the DK crush and the stepwise approach that we all know that we learned here with the bifurcation club. And I'll show you what happened here. 
well, this is how we started and this is how it ended. And so we had a nice result. So I was just looking at that IVIS. Actually, I thought it was three years ago, but it was actually four years ago in June of 2019. And uh, this lady um, was in the newspaper today actually celebrating her art. So there was a spot there. Was, she's in the Gross Point um, newspaper in Detroit. So she's alive and still doing well. The cardiologist who I helped do this case actually incidentally sent me that uh, earlier this afternoon. So happy report. She's doing well. So some of the technical challenges that we had in this case, we were able to wire the LAD, that tight lesion in the mid. However, our microcatheter of choice for this case was a Caravel. Uh, for those of you guys that uh, use it, it's a very low profile microcatheter, probably the, has the best crossing profile and it wouldn't cross. And so when it doesn't cross these lesions, but the wire crosses, um, there's a few things that you could do. We were fortunate that we advanced it as far as we could and used the Viper wire to free wire it that allowed us to do the atherectomy. We chose to spend uh, only the LAD as we discussed and deferred spinning uh, the circ because of the angle. We did Ivis guided DK crush. The patient uh, was taken off Pompella uh, the next day on uh, post-procedure day number two. Um, axillary access for mechanical circulatory support and cardiogenic shock. Uh, we, we published this in 2019. This was uh, based on a series of cases that we did at the DMC at the time. Over the course of one year, we had 17 patients who came in in shock and iliofemoral disease that was felt to be hostile. And we published our experience. And you can see from our experience, um, I think the notable things are important is that the time to impella activation as it relates to minutes was 14.8 minutes. Which, led, you know, which means that you could actually put an impella in the axillary artery in a relatively quick time. Probably not as fast as the femoral, obviously, but 15 minutes is not bad. Uh, these, all these patients had CPs, so really robust devices. Most of them we put in the right. I think that's just because uh, it was technically easier in the room setup. Um, what's interesting is that if you look at the survival of these patients, uh, on our 17 patients, only five of them survived. And if you look at the of the five that survived, how were we able to close? Uh, one of them really with pre-close, it worked. Two of them with balloon, prolonged inflation with balloon tamponade, two of the survivors required a covered stent. But you could see that, you know, you talk about bifurcation left main in the setting of shock and PAD portends a very poor prognosis. So five out of 17 uh, have survived uh, with this approach based on our experience. So. I think we all know that acute cornea syndrome with left main uh, is associated with a very high mortality. Uh, traditionally, you know, left main disease historically has been surgical disease, but I think, uh, you know, the people on this call and the panel uh, know that we could treat these patients safely now with robust devices that have allowed us kind of to do these more complex procedures safely. I think it's fair to say that for contemporary interventional cardiologists taking call, that having uh, the skills to use advanced mechanical support devices, do atherectomy, understanding the bifurcation techniques are very critical. And I think we all uh, can agree that left main PCI should be guided 100% of the time with imaging. It's debatable uh, about PAD um, and hostile iliofemoral disease, depending on the, on the discretion of the operator, the utilization of advanced mechanical support devices. I see a lot of patients who present with cardiogenic shock and on the angiogram, uh, sometimes the vessels are deemed too small. And I think that's because they're vasoconstricted or on multiple pressors. Um, but I think that in most patients, if you have, uh, if there's a will, there's a way we could get these devices in and oftentimes they could be life-saving. So uh, that's kind of the presentation. Do you guys have any questions or comments on uh, the use of uh, alternative access in shock or the bifurcation in this case. Um, Amir, uh, you have a nine French now, right? Did you have a trial? Do you think you'd have gone through this hostile anatomy? Yes, I think that the, the nine French ECP is, uh, is definitely gonna be transformational. It's a game changer. Uh, Bobber is a co-investigator on that. He could share his experience. But yes, to answer your question, it would have easily tracked through uh, not only uh, severe tortuosity like this case, but even PAD. I think now with shockwave for iliofemorals and our experience from the TAVR uh, world, 
um, there's going to be, I think, less and less need for alternative access in the acute setting. The axillary is, is a really nice access uh, for when you need durability. So uh, you need to keep these devices in for a long time, longer than a few days. But to be very honest with you, in my experience, the best uh, access if you're going to use axillary is a surgical cut down. If you leave these pumps in and the axillary for a long time, when I say a long time, 48 to 72, 96 hours, we start to see thrombosis uh, despite, you know, good anticoagulation at the axillary, something that we really don't understand. So if you're going to keep it in, uh, usually if I have somebody on an axillary impel in the setting of acute MI shock, by the third or fourth day, I ask the surgeons to cut down on the other axillary and and, and put a, a conduit there for us because we see thrombosis. But in a pinch, I think this is a really good access uh, if you need it for a short duration, obviously TAVR, but Impella to save someone's life in AMI or do a high-risk PCI, the access works really good. Yeah, once you, great case. And once, once you know, you made that decision or realized that you're going to need to drill with Timmy, you know, less than Timmy 3 flow in both of the arteries, I mean, I think you're 100% right. If you don't feel comfortable going transfemoral, then to really take it up a notch with um, uh, MCS through an alternative, I mean, impella through an alternative access because a balloon pump would not have been enough once you start drilling and you've got, you know, less than 3 flow in both of those arteries. I just, I don't think a balloon pump would have been enough. And I think you would have been trying to, you know, escalate very quickly in a, in a terrible situation where the cat's already, you know, or whatever, whatever the idiom is, it's already out of the barn. <laughs> the train's already left the station. Yes. There was a question in the chat. I can't open my chats. Dr. Rab, can you? Uh, it it said, just says, was it thrombus or calcium in the LMCA and LAD? Yeah, so it was mixed, but it was predominantly calcium. There was some thrombus in the mid LAD, uh, probably attributing, you know, to the diminished flow that you saw, but uh, the lesions were very, very heavily calcified predominantly calcium. And I'm, I'm not convinced, you know, uh, we do a lot of imaging. Uh, I have a hard time uh, making the distinction of thrombus and, and IVIS. You know, probably uh, maybe some of you guys are better than I am at interpreting it. I find it to be much easier uh, to tell thrombus when we're doing OCT. Uh, but uh, on IVIS, it's very hard for me to identify the thrombus. We have a really good image at our, our lab. He's always pointing it out to me and I still can't see what he's seeing. So I think it's going to take a long time. Amir, I mean, go back to the IVIS images. There are some pointers to the calcium. And I think it's important for the audience to know that. Yes, sir. And, and while you're pulling that up, I'll also point, I mean, one thing that struck me about both of these cases, you know, these are patients in their 80s, critical disease, MCS, bifurcation. This is what we're all faced with now. This, these are the normal cases. And I think that's very, very different from 10 years ago. And uh, I, I think it really coming upon all of us to up our game and keep, you know, um, uh, incorporating new technology and new, and new skills. And the other thing I thought really was great is there's so much binary decision making on the fly here that I hope's not missed about looking at data, making decision, pivoting based on what you find. And then also the last thing you pointed out, Amir, which I think is really key, um, is that you uh, did this case with another colleague. So yeah. I don't think that's done enough. And if you have a complex case like this and you have that ability, don't be shy, reach out, particularly early career. I cannot overstate that enough. And I'm, I'm glad you made mention um, of that. Anyhow, I'll let you mention, talk yeah. about the calcium here. Yeah, well, just one comment, because I think that's super important, Alex. I think there's, uh, just so everybody knows, I think there's very few people out, uh, in the world that um, have done as many impellas uh, as Dr. Schreiber, and I would say myself, you know, maybe a, a handful of people. That being said, every single impella case to this day, uh, him and I do together without question. And if I'm out of town or he's out of town, we have a second operator there who's also an attending, and we, we have the good fortune of working with fellows. But the point is, though, very well taken. Every single high risk PCI case it adds tremendous. I've never had a case where I regretted having, uh, you know, Dr. Schreiber uh, be my assistant and him vice versa. And I think that's important. You're not going to need, uh, you know, a co-pilot on every case, but when you do need it, it makes a huge difference. And I think uh, you're very right, Alex. And, uh, you know, I, at our place, it's a mandate and it works out very well. I know everyone's time is valuable and they're bu very busy, but I think in these patients, uh, it's time that's well served. 
so talk this image about the virus what, patient too. Yeah. This image is very important to show to you, the audience that you know, there's heavy dense calcium that you can see which protrudes into the vessel, okay? And also, also over here, between uh, nine and, uh, and 11, these are nodularities that project. This is a nodular, it, it, these are nodular calcified lesions, okay? So there's no question, okay? Now, yeah. so this irregularity, which does not have a negative shadow behind it, could be thrombus sitting here, but these are just nodules sitting in that, in that left leg, okay? Yes. Question about it. Yes. Uh, one of the final question, Barbara, from you is that revascularization of the non culprit vessel is a very different thing than the complete trial, okay? In the complete trial, most patients were very stable, so you could do them the next day or within a week or within 45 days. So timing of the non culprit vessel and shock, what are your thoughts about it? I mean, well, there's a different animal altogether, right? I mean, so, so what, what are you what is thinking as to when they should go to revascularization? Yeah, I have very strong feelings on this topic, and I think it's extremely misunderstood. So the vast majority of patients in culprit shock who survived actually did get staged PCI. And so I think that's something that really is very missing. It's not culprit and then, um, you know, leave them alone. And, um, you know, I think even um, ECLS shock, which just came out last month, was something that was really interesting to me was that actually 25% of patients had non-culprit PCI. Right. And that's from the group that actually did the culprit shock trial. And what it shows is, is that data is there to help support decision making, but it is not um, uh, something that we have to feel that needs to be done um, uh, on a case by case basis, meaning to say that you know there's a lot of heterogeneity in these sick patients. And so even 25% um, of ECLS shock patients needed non-culprit PCI. So I think in general, my feeling in the shock world is to try to do just culprit only upfront, don't do anything too complex. And then, um, you know, you kind of go case by case in terms of what you should do thereafter. I think ultimately, most of these patients benefit from close to complete revascularization if you can get that for them. But I think you can definitely stage it, take time with it, and you know, um, get them started on guideline-directed medical therapy first. Yeah, I think we have a you know a few trials now that says at least it's it's um, in a in a in a patient where things you know are relatively stable that it, it is safe and appropriate to be doing it before discharge rather than waiting longer than after discharge. Um, and so I would I would lean towards that if again such as the cases that you show. Well, um, Alex, any final words uh, from the end? I, I, I'll leave it up to, to you as the godfather, but I think we're probably out of, uh, out of time. So you, you, you always get the final word, Tanvir. <clears throat> well, thank you very much. Uh, this, these are really great, but not too common cases. And thank you very much for the excellent cases and presentation. I hope it was educational for our audience. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thanks.